The following recorded program is part of the Mount Sinai Medical Center Lecture Series, offered by Mount Sinai Medical Center in cooperation with the City of Sunny Isles Beach. Good morning. Um, like Regina said, I'm Dr. Luciano. Um, thank you for coming um, today. So today I'm going to be talking about the well woman exam. Okay, so I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist at the Mount Sinai uh, Medical Center in Miami Beach. Um, and then we're going to basically cover uh, multiple things that the well woman exam um, should be covered, okay? <clears throat> so basically the annual exam, so the well woman exam for um, I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist. The purpose of that exam is basically to counsel the patient on the healthy lifestyle, okay, and minimizing health risks, okay? So the same way that you go to your primary care physician to check your thyroid, check your diabetes, um, blood test, all of the blood pressure, things like that, we also should be doing exactly the same thing, okay? So not only does the obstetrician and gynecology well woman exam is not just a breast exam, a pap smear, and a pelvic exam, it should be, it should cover um, multiple other things on, and like I mentioned, basically one of them is counseling the patient. Um, and there's di different assessments that we do depending on the patient's age, because of course the risk factors depending on the patient's age um, change, okay? But the standard components should be, we should be checking the health status on, of the patient. Have they gotten their immunizations, the flu vaccine, the pneumonia vaccine, meningitis vaccine? How is their nutrition? Are they exercising? Um, do they eat a health, do they have a healthy diet? Um, sexual practices, are sexually active or not sexually active? One partner, multiple partners, um, any type of physical activity or restrictions to that physical activity, and like I mentioned, immunization. So all of that should be covered in a well woman exam, even if your primary care physician already covered in their, in their visit. Or if you don't have a primary care physician, then some women just go to the gynecologist as their primary care physician. So the common questions that I get um, from friends, family members, um, friends from family members are, is the annual exam just a pap smear and a pelvic exam? So like I mentioned, the answer is no. Um, a lot of people think that you go to the gynecologist just for that. Some patients do get sent to the gynecologist from their primary care physician, so they do have all the other testing and vaccinations that I mentioned from their primary care, and they just go, they get referred to the gynecologist just for their breast exam, pelvic exam, and their pap smears if they need it. But like I mentioned again, the gynecologist should be covering everything because it has to be uh, a full um, history and physical, okay? The second question that I get is, do I get a pap smear every single time that I have to have a pelvic exam? And the answer is no. The recommendations from pap smears changed, um, we're in 2019, so around 2012, before they used to be done every single year. Now the recommendation is to do what we call co-testing, and I'm gonna talk about that a little later, but that's basically doing a pap smear, which is basically scraping the superficial cells from the cervix, so basically the opening of the uterus, and we also send it for the human papilloma virus, which is the virus that has been shown that can cause changes on the cervix and could potentially cause cancer on the cervix. So when you do that type of testing, which is called co-testing, the recommendation now is that you do it every five years. Some physicians are doing it every three. They feel like every five is pushing it a little too much. For example, I do it every three years, but the recommendation by the book is every five years. And the third question that I always get, can I just skip the OBGYN's office if I do not need a pap smear? The answer is no, okay? So like I mentioned, the exam in the visit is not only a pelvic exam, it's not only a pap smear, we cover different things. So it is very important to go visit the gynecologist every single year. After what age? I'm sorry? 21 years old. So I, I recommend after 21 
that's when we start doing the pelvic exam and the pap smears. Of course, um, any uh, younger um, patient that has any issues, any problems, they I always recommend to come in earlier. Mm -mm. So what should be expected during a well woman exam? So typically, if it's a completely new patient, we want to cover all the bases. We want to basically get a full, complete history, okay? So any medical problems, any surgeries in the past, allergies, like I mentioned, activity, nutrition, vaccinations, sexual um, activities, um, what type of medications they're taking, um, socially, who do they live with? Do they live in a home? Do they live in their own house? Do they live with family members, married, divorced, widowed? We want to know all of that. That way we basically get to know the patient very well. The physical exam should cover, it should be a complete physical exam. It should be, we should be listening to the lungs, I'm sorry, to the lungs, to the heart. We should be examining the abdomen. Of course, we always do a thyroid um, exam. We want to do a breast exam. We want to do the pelvic exam. It depends on the patient's age, okay? So we don't always have to do a pelvic exam. Um, if the patient comes in with a complaint, I'm having pelvic pain, um, I'm having pelvic pressure, any type of pelvic complaint, the recommendation is that we do do an exam. Um, in the older population, I've, I, I know that a lot of patients are like, I feel completely fine. The pelvic exam I know is a very uncomfortable exam and some patients decide, I feel fine, I really don't want it and that is perfectly fine, okay? Um, so evaluation and counseling, um, the same thing that I mentioned, we want to see um, the patient's um, physical activity, nutrition, we want to have an assessment of their family life, their home life, is there any type of risk for domestic violence, any type of risk of negligence, things like that. Risk factors, we want to know their family history. Do they have a family history of, for example, diabetes, have a family member that has had heart problems, colon cancer, things like that. That way we can make a list and a checklist of what this patient should need during their uh, well woman exam, what things we should cover. That way we can prevent some of those um, possible um, medical issues. Immunizations, like I mentioned, we know that we're almost at the end of the flu season, so that's one of the vaccinations that we always talk about, especially when we are during flu season. So September till March, we always offer, ask the patient, have you gotten your flu shot? If they say no, we want to offer them. Of course, if, they're not, if they don't have any type of allergies to the vaccination, we always offer them the vaccination. We talk to them about um, the potential risk and the potential benefits of the vaccination. Once we give them all the information, the decision is the patient's decision to see if they do want to get the vaccine or not. We cannot make you guys do something that you don't want to do. And then depending on different ages, the recommendations for different vaccines, specifically after 65, the vaccination for pneumonia and the vaccination for um, shingles, okay? And then psychosocial, we want to see how mood-wise how they are. Um, and then, like I mentioned again, family, uh, family life and home life. Um, do they see their family? Are they alone? Um, do they live in a home? Any type of uh, risk for um, domestic violence, depression, um, suicide, all of that we need to assess. <clears throat> so I'm going to basically, on um, age specific evaluations, like I mentioned, some of the things we cover on the younger population, some of the things we cover um, depending on the age. So in the history, besides everything that I mentioned, when we have in the age group between 40 and 64 years old, we want to start talking about premenopausal symptoms. Are you getting any hot flashes? Are your periods getting irregular? Oh, and menopausal thing, um, symptoms. So how, how long have you gone without a period? Um, hot flashes, um, vaginal dryness, and every, every other changes that you can see 
during perimenopause and the menopausal stage. We want to talk about incontinence. A lot of patients don't feel comfortable, especially when they go to a new doctor, to a new office, they don't feel comfortable talking about that. So it is our job to bring up the topic. Because uh, once we, I've noticed that once you actually ask them about any type of symptoms, and you can be like, I, I do it very easily. I just say any problems voiding. Are you having issues going to the bathroom, having bowel movements? Are you having, um, does it burn when you urinate? When you cough or laugh or try to do any type of exercise, do you notice that a little bit of urine leaks? So sometimes when you present it like that, the patient feels a lot more comfortable talking about that topic. So that's one of the main things that we need to cover. Another of the things that we should be covering in this age group is prolapse. So prolapse is basically, um, when after the the biggest risk is basically vaginal birth, so a normal birth and multiple um, having multiple babies, especially babies on the bigger side. So when you are want to assess if a patient has, is having any issues prolapse wise, you want to ask them if they're if they have any discomfort in the genital area. Do they feel like they have like a bulge, or do they feel pressure? Um, if they have a sexual intercourse, does it is it uncomfortable? Does it hurt? Those are the things that we need to um, assess for, because um, that can happen. Basically, the the muscles of the pelvis become very weak as age passes, so you can have um, prolapse, which is and it could be from the bladder, it could be from the rectum, it can be the uterus. So those are all things that we need to assess. In the physical exam, like I mentioned, it should be a complete physical exam. We always verify the weight and the height of the patient. Patients always complain when they have to go check their weight. Um, we always verify the blood pressure. We have a lot of patients that do have a history of high blood pressure. So we want to make sure that on the medication that they're on, that their blood pressures are stable. Some patients come in and they are nervous to visit a new doctor and we've noticed that their blood pressure can be slightly elevated even if they have taken their blood pressure medication. I usually tell them, uh, and the patient usually will say, my blood pressure is always normal. I'm, I'm just nervous. So just to make sure that I'm not missing anything, I usually tell them, okay, I want you to go home. Once you go home, rest for a couple of hours and verify your blood pressure again. And then give us a call at the office or I just tell them I'm gonna call you a little later just to see what that number was. I want to make sure that there's nothing abnormal going on. Um, and like I mentioned, full exam, so from head um, basically to toe, we want to make sure that everything looks normal. Mm -hmm. Now, testing-wise, um, labs and um, other type of testing that we do. So like I mentioned, the cervical cytology is the pap smear. So pap smear, uh, pap smear's uh, recommendation changed. Now, if we, when from 30 years, you start to do your pap smears at 21 years old, from 21 um, till 29 years old, you only do the cytology, which is just the checking of the cells on the superficial layer of the cervix, okay? And that is done every three years, as long as it's normal. Starting at 30 years old until 65 years old, we do what I mentioned, which is co-testing. We do the cytology and the HPV testing, so the human papil papilloma virus testing. And the recommendation is to do it every five years as long as the results are normal. If there's any type of abnormal results, there's other things that we have to do, we, um, which is a biopsy. But I'm not going to go into that right now. The colorectal cancer screening, um, the recommendation is if you don't have any family members with a history of colon cancer, you get your screening colonoscopy at 50 years old. And typically, if it's normal, it's repeated every 10 years. There's other testing that you can do for colorectal cancer, which is the checking for blood in the feces, feces um, and other imaging studies that can be done. But the main, main, most important one is doing the, colon the screening colonoscopy starting at 50 years old. Now, diabetes, HIV, the lipid profile, which is cholesterol, mammography, and thyroid, those are on someone that does not have any medical problems. So they're not diabetic. They don't have uh, elevated cholesterol. They don't have a thyroid issue. 
they are done every um, three to five years. And that's the, what we call the screening test. It's basically to verify the labs to prevent something. Um, if, there's some, if it's borderline, then we can act on it early to prevent from the disease to progress to a full-blown problem, okay? The mammography, there's different uh, recommendations depending on the college that you're looking at. We go by the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. The recommendation is to do it, start to do it at 40 years old, do it yearly, and there's no expiration date. So you continue to do it for the life of the patient, okay? That is what we do. Um, the American Cancer Society has a different recommendation. So each college, it, it varies a little bit, but by, by ours is start at 40 every single year until basically the patient passes away. <clears throat> so this is like I mentioned the recommendation for the pap smear um, testing. Um, over 65 years old, if the patient doesn't have any type of diagnosis of cervical cancer um, or endometrial cancer, any type, of, any type of cancer that they removed the uterus due to cancer and they don't have any history of an abnormal pap smear, you stop doing pap smears at that moment, okay? So over, I'm sorry, over 65, as long as the pap smears are normal, that's when you stop doing pap smears. If the patient has had a hysterectomy for benign reasons, so not something that was cancer or precancer, you stop doing the pap smears at the moment that the hysterectomy was done. As long as they removed everything, including the cervix, which is the opening of the uterus. If the cervix was left in and they only removed the body of the uterus, then you, you, you still need to continue doing the regular screening on the stump of the cervix, okay? Because it's still, it, that organ is still there, so you still need to do the screening to prevent anything from happening. And this is what I mentioned about the different um, screening mammogram guidelines. So ours is basically this one, the one that says ACOG. So the one, two, three, the fourth one. So we start at 40, you do it every single year, and there's no expiration date. And depending, for example, the second one that says ACS, that's the American Cancer Society. They recommend to start it at 45. You can do it every other year. And then starting at 54, then you do it every single year. And then you stop <clears throat> when the lifespan of the patient is expected to be less than 10 years old. I'm 10 years, I'm sorry. Um, that's a little hard to calculate because some people live till they're 80, some people live till they're 120. So that's why I prefer to go by my college, which is indefinite. You do it until the patient basically passes away. Now, um, continuing with the um, uh, exam from 40 years old to 64, um, when we talk about basically sex, sexuality, we want to talk to the patient uh, if they always offer sexually transmitted disease testing, okay? Um, the recommendation is in the younger population that they are at higher risk of um, contracting chlamydia, gonorrhea, any type of STD, so the recommendation is to do it yearly. From 40 years old and over, it should always be offered up to the patient to have the testing done or not. However, if the patient has had any type of new sexual um, partner or any type of high-risk activity or they have multiple partners, unprotected intercourse, things like that, the recommendation is to do it every single time that they are exposed or have that high-risk um, activity exposure. And then in the um, younger population, you always want to talk about contraception. Um, are they on any type of contraception? Do they want to be on any type of contraception? Can they be on any type of contraception? Because most, except for one of the contraceptions, every single contraception has hormones. So we have to verify if the patient does not have any type of contraindications to give them those hormones. It's always a combination either of estrogen and progesterone 
or only progesterone. And there are certain medical conditions where you cannot give the estrogen, like having a history of breast cancer, having a history of um, blood clots, either on the uh, legs or in their lungs, even a family history that could potentially put the patient at a higher risk of developing that, you should um, not use the estrogen part of the birth control. And then the social, psychosocial part of the exam, we want to talk, I mentioned already, I mentioned this already, we want to talk up, um, assess and talk about any risk factors for domestic violence, any type of stressors in their life, anything that could potentially put the patient at higher risk for depression, anxiety, and suicide and any type of sleep disorders. We know that as we get older, we don't tend to sleep as much. Our, our sleep is most of the time interrupted. We wanna know if that is because we just cannot sleep or we're waking up multiple times during the night to go to the bathroom to void, things like that. Because those are things, if it's an issue that the patient, for example, has a bladder infection that can be treated um, that can be diagnosed and treated easily. If it's something different that is not something physical, is something um, psychological, that can also be addressed um, during that exam. And talking about risk factors, we wanna know if the patient is a high risk of having any type of cardiac issues, any type, any family history of um, heart attacks, problems with the, um, with the arteries um, and um, high risk, for example, elevated cholesterol, a high fat diet, sedentary lifestyle, things like that. We wanna know if the patient is a higher risk for cancer. So any type of genetic uh, component to cancers, we wanna know the family history for that. Because if the patient can be tested early, to see if they have a gene that could potentially put them at risk for developing cancer. We wanna know that very early because we can intervene early. Uh, we wanna talk about hygiene. We wanna talk about the risk of sun exposure. We wanna make sure that they are protecting their skin. Skin cancer is very prevalent um, nowadays, so we need to avoid um, that. And we wanna always assess the use of alcohol, um, smoking, and any type of drug use. Like I mentioned, vaccinations. Um, in this age group, the recommendation is um, the shingles vaccine at 60 years old. Um, and then the specific ones, depending on the, on the, um, on the risk of the, of the patient. So if the patient has any chronic diseases, any chronic lung issues, for example, the pneumonia vaccine is recommended earlier. And on someone that is completely healthy, then it's recommended at 65 years old. And then the hepatitis and hepat hepatitis A and B, most of the time A is if you're traveling to an area that hepatitis A is very prevalent. Um, usually third world countries, the recommendation is that you, if you have not had that vaccination given, that you get it um, before you go on the, on the trip to prevent you from um, getting infected. Hepatitis B most of the time is for healthcare workers. Uh, for us, um, basically, if you, we once you hit, once you go into med school, it's a requirement because you eventually, at your third year of med school, you have to go to the hospitals for the rotations and all that. So every single healthcare worker, doctors, nurses, physician assistants, um, um, therapy, um, um, and respiratory therapy, physical therapy, anybody that basically is in a hospital in and out every single day, that's a, that's a patient that should get the hepatitis B vaccine. The MMR is a vaccine that we get as a toddler and some patients do not develop immunity to the vaccine. So sometimes, and now with the uh, anti-vaccination um, issue that we're having in the United States, um, everybody should get tested to verify if they had immunization develop, if not a booster should be given. Now for 65 years and older, the, basically the history and the physical exam doesn't change. We always want to assess the same things. Uh, like I mentioned, very, very prevalent in this age group. We want to talk about symptoms of menopause. We want to talk about symptoms of incontinence and prolapse. 
besides everything else that we normally talk about. Physical exam doesn't change. Testing wise, there's a, diff a little different on the testing. There's some tests that we add uh, when we uh, 65 and over. The most important one is the bone density test. Okay, so it's called the DEXA scan. It is a test that we do to see if the patient has osteoporosis or is a higher risk of developing osteoporosis or if they already have low bone density. So on a patient that is completely healthy, they don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't, the, does not have any type of chronic condition that would require steroids, um, and they're not extremely thin, the recommendation is that you do, as, uh, you do the bone density test at 65 years old. That's the screening test. If it is normal, you should repeat it every two to three years. If the, de if the testing is abnormal and you have to start the patient on either medication for osteoporosis or um, calcium and vitamin D supplementation to prevent because the bone density was already found to be low, you should repeat it in one to two years, no more than two years to see the progression because if it's getting worse, you have to start the, the patient on, me, on other medication. If it's stable or getting better, you can continue on the vi calcium and vitamin D supplementation. So you always want to follow up to make sure, because the older we get, the higher the risk we have of fractures, and hip fractures, um, spinal fractures, and unfortunately with that comes a lot more complications because most of the time, we don't end up completely immobile, but, but our mobility definitely gets compromised. So you can get other types of complications from that. Like I mentioned, the pap smear, 65 years old, as long as you have your history of pap smear is completely normal, so you have not had any abnormal pap smear, no precancerous cells on your cervix, at 65 years old, you stop doing the pap smear. If the patient has a history of ever having an abnormal pap smear then or a cancer diagnosis cervical cancer or endometrial cancer you need to continue doing the pap smear for 20 years from the day that the diagnosis was given to the patient okay so even if they don't have a cervix or a uterus basically the pap smear is still done we just do it in the vaginal wall because there has been shown that it can progress to the vaginal wall, so that's why we always have to verify. Like I mentioned, we always want to verify diabetes, cholesterol status, thyroid status, and at 65 and over, we always start to do a urine test. The reason why we do the urine test, we want to make sure that there's no microscopic blood in the urine. Okay, so when I say microscopic blood, basically the patient cannot see the blood when they, when they void. We cannot see it, but it's seen when the pathologist looks at the urine with the microscope. And that's, an, that's a risk factor for bladder cancer. So the way that we can screen to make sure that the patient is okay is by doing a simple urine test. And the mammogram, like I mentioned, yearly, on, in, uh, with no expiration date. <clears throat> now, testing-wise, lab, when I say hemoglobin, we want to basically make sure that the patient is not anemic. The older that we get, we can have chronic um, conditions or kidney conditions that can make uh, the, the body not produce um, enough uh, hemoglobin, so we become anemic, the patient can feel tired, very pale, they can have heart problems because of the anemia, so we always want to verify that. High risk populations, we want to see hepatitis, um, the status of the hepatitis C. When I say high risk populations, these are the patients that have, that received a blood transfusion before the general testing of the blood um, pints were done, and it, it was usually before the 1980s. And then, of course, HIV always offered, sexually transmitted disease testing should always be um, being offered, and tuberculosis on patients that are high risk, or if they're going to a country that, um, that is high risk with tuberculosis. I already mentioned this, this mammograms again. 
And then, like I mentioned, this is our the indications for um, the bone density testing. So anybody, any women that's 65 years and old, over, any men that is 70 years and older. Um, if you have a family history, like a first, rel a first degree relative, a mom that has had a hip fracture or a spine fracture, so basically a fragility fracture early in their life, that testing should be done early on that patient. You should not wait until 65 years old because it might be too late when they're 65. I've actually diagnosed osteoporosis on a 44-year-old patient that her mother, very, very high-risk family history, and I said, you know what, let's, let's get it done. Um, and she, was, she had osteoporosis, so we immediately started her on medica medication, and um, she actually improved uh, within two years, so that was um, good. Um, and like I mentioned, any type of medication that could affect the density of the bones, mostly steroids. So patients that are on chronic steroid medications, those are the ones that you really, really need to watch for very closely. Um, patients that smoke and are very, very thin are extremely high risk of fractures. So the same thing. Though on those patients, that testing should be done earlier than 65 years old. <clears throat> During, um, so the well woman visit, we also want to, 65 years and older, we want to talk about sexuality. Um, if they're having any problems, any pain, any discomfort, most of the, the biggest complaint in this age group is that. Um, and any type of risk um, behaviors, high risk behaviors, and talk about sexually transmitted disease and, and safe sex practices. Psychosocial, the same thing. We want to talk about neglect, abuse, any type of stressors, sleep disorders, and like I mentioned, we want to assess any type of risk for depression, anxiety, and suicide. <clears throat> risk factors are mostly the same as in the previous age group. Um, in the most important, one of the most important one that changes from the 40 to 64 is injury prevention and vision. We want to make sure that they are up to date going to their eye doctor, even though if they don't use any type of uh, reading glasses or any other type of glasses, we want to make sure that they are um, up to date on that exam. And injury prevention, the same thing. We want to see, do you live on a two-story house? Do you live on a one-story house? Do you live in a condo? Um, what type of shoes are you using? Are you using proper um, shoes? If you have to use a cane, if you have to use a walker, that those things are um, adequate and that you're not at high risk of like falling or slipping or things like that. And like I mentioned, the immunizations, 65 and over, her, the shingles vaccine and the pneumonia vaccine are the most important ones in these age group besides the flu vaccination anywhere from September till March. It has been shown that the, the influenza, so the flu, is um, worse on the extremes of population, so the very young population and the old population, and unfortunately also in the pregnant population. So um, the pregnant women, we also recommend getting the flu vaccine every single year especially if they're uh, like during the pregnancy and it doesn't affect the baby at all. So, by show of hands, who have you guys have you guys been told that you need to do a self breast examination every single month? I'm seeing a yes. Okay. So typically before they used to recommend that every single patient checks their breast while they're showering arm up and you check in a circular motion, okay? So now we don't recommend that the patient does a self-breast examination looking for something, looking for abnormalities, okay? The recommendation is, and the reason why we stopped recommending that is when you're looking for something, you tend to find something that is not really there. You think there's something. So 
it tends to give a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety to the patient, and by studies it has been shown that we get a lot of false positive exams, and then the physician starts ordering tests and biopsies and this and that, and then it just becomes a vicious cycle. The recommendation is that you are aware of how your breasts feel and how your breasts look. And if you see anything that is not that, anything from the normal, then immediately you should call your doctor. Be your primary care physician or be us, be the gynecologist. Um, because probably you know how your breasts feel, you know how your breasts look. If you notice any type of redness on your skin, any type of discharge from the nipple, you notice, you feel or notice a lump, that is definitely not normal. So this is a little um, patient um, information that our college prepared um, this past year for the patients uh, that we usually hand out at the office, basically saying, what is your annual, what woman exam um, include? Okay, so basically we talk about birth control, we do cancer screening, not only cervical cancer, but we talk about breast cancer screening and we talk about colon, um, colorectal cancer screening. Talk vaccinations, health screening, health screening, diabetes, cholesterol, high blood pressure. We talk about depression screening, sexually transmitted disease, concerns about sex, weight control. That's why we always check your weight, even though you guys don't like it. Um, any type of issues with either pelvic pain, periods, menstruation, things like that. Uh, when the patient's trying to get pregnant, we can talk about the preconception counseling, what should and should not be done, and basically other types of reasons, any issues, anything like that. We always are welcomed with open doors. And please, please, please schedule your yearly exam. It is very, very important. Any questions? Yes. Oh, she's rubbing the... Thank you. Back here. Start back here. Thank you, Doctor. What about hernias in the around the belly button? Do you check for that? We check. Well, we you know, like a, uh, some kind of a mm -hmm. lump there. So we always do an abdominal exam. We don't operate hernias. Um, the general surgeon usually does, but if we do find something abnormal. We'll put, we'll put a referral in for, for what, whatever specialty we have to, mostly general surgery. That way they can assess and see if it needs to be repaired uh, with surgery. Definitely. How, what, do you, what would you look for, a lump? A lump, yeah. Mostly if it's umbilical, if it's in the belly button, if the patient like, kind of like uh, pushes, you're going to see a little, uh, like a little bump coming out, and then all of a sudden it goes back in. And then if they, if they squeeze again, it's going to come out and then come back in. And even us, just on exam, if, I, if you have a hernia and we push in the belly button, we're going to be able, our, our finger is going to be able to go into the belly button more than on someone that doesn't have a hernia. So we, we're able to diagnose it. And then you recommend surgery. Well, we recommend that you go to the general, we send you to the general surgeon and then they would see if it needs to be, most of the hernias, yes, do need to be repaired with surgery. Okay. And one other thing, mm -hmm. what's considered a third world country? Is Bermuda on that list? No. Uh, for example, like India, um, Africa, I don't want to say, I don't want to say a country and then all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, Dr. Luciano said something that is so wrong. But most of the time, if, if the patient, like for example, nowadays it's very, at least I have a lot of friends that want to go uh, visit like Taiwan, India, um, Beijing, um, Thailand, things like that. Those type of patients need to get the, 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 for those trips, they need to get the hepatitis A vaccine. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi. Hi. On the vaccinations, mm -hmm. uh, the MMR, mm -hmm. is that related in any way with autism? Mm, from, with studies that have been um, done, no. 
Any other that you can think of? Vaccinations that are related to autism? None of the vaccinations. Per studies have been shown to be related to autism. None of the vaccinations that the toddlers get. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. I've heard different comments and I'm not sure how to, uh, to deal with it. Mm -hmm. If people are taking certain medications mm -hmm. and they also take vitamin pills mm -hmm. on their own, are the vitamin pills causing any disruption to the medication which they're taking? It depends on the medication. Okay, so normally, if you take a multivitamin, like a multivitamin supplement, the amount that is in a multivitamin supplement should not affect any of the medications, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, lupus, things like that. Now, if you take other natural supplements, um, for example, ginkgo biloba, bilo bilo I can't pronounce it, I'm sorry, um, St. John's wort, things like that, those medications can interact with, I mean, those supplements can have the potential of interacting with certain medications. But it, when I say certain medications, they're very limited. For example, if we have a patient that is on an anticoagulant medication, so basically it thins their blood, there's certain foods that they cannot eat, there's some certain natural supplements that they cannot take, because they can, it, it may potentially thin the blood even more. So the risk of the patient bleeding, having a brain bleed, having a stomach bleed or an intestinal bleed is very, very high. But a, a regular multivitamin should not affect the medications. Um, what about aspirin? There's been comments that taking... Uh, a baby aspirin. Yeah, or two, mm -hmm. which some doctors recommend. Mm -hmm. The person is older. Mm -hmm. uh, other doctors don't seem to agree with that. What is the reasoning behind that the I, difference? I, that I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm with the doctors that do recommend it. Um, if a baby aspirin, basically 81 milligrams of aspirin on a patient that has, Actually, it's recommended for everybody as long as they are not on an anticoagulant medication, but specifically on patients that have higher risk of um, cardiac um, problems. So basically a patient that has higher risk of having a heart attack um, or any type of, of, of heart issue, the recommendation is that they take a, a, a baby aspirin. Why some doctors don't recommend it, I can't, I, I can't say. To be honest. Well, it's only if you've had some kind of a heart attack do they seem to recommend it for some reason. Uh, some of them want two baby aspirin, so that was something uh, that I don't that was questioning. That I don't know. That you would need even call like to talk to a cardiologist. They would be the best person to ask that. Mm-hmm. If a person has a balance problem. Mm-hmm requires, uh, you know, a, a cane or a walker. Mm -hmm. Can medication or certain medications over time cause that? Depends the on... The person is bipolar, so they are taking something in that direction, also for cholesterol and other issues. I couldn't tell you. That's way over my span of medical expertise. Puncture says if you're taking more than two medications, mm -hmm. they won't treat you because they feel that medications have some some indication. There. I don't know. I honestly, I wouldn't be able to tell you, and I don't want to tell you something that's wrong. Yeah. For the shingles vaccine, mm -hmm. do you recommend the single or the double protocol? Um, our college recommends the single um, protocol. Um, but I know there's different um, views um, in that aspect, at least, for example, in our, in our office, uh, we have the, the single protocol available. Um, I don't believe we have the double protocol um, available, to be honest. Is there any negative, negative reason for not using the double? No. Mm -mm. 
No, I think I believe the double protocol is just a newer, um, a newer um, vaccination. Um, like for example, the same for the like the Gardasil, which is the human papilloma virus that before it used to only cover for three types of the of the virus, and now we have one. I'm sorry. Yeah, three, and now we have one that covers for nine. I believe it's um, around the same thing, but I cannot tell you 100 percent sure. And on the human papillomavirus mm -hmm. uh, vaccinations, are they, are they being done generally now for young children mm -hmm. in Florida? Yeah, they're doing both for female and male, 12 years, um, until 12 years old until 26. And not a couple of months ago, an article came out that now they're recommending it to extend it up to 46 years old. We're still waiting for the full approval um, for that, uh, but as of now, 12 to 26 years old. And I also noticed that on your chart, it recommended bone density testing for men mm -hmm. over age 70. I've mm -hmm. never heard that before. Is there any specific uh, change in the thinking recently? No, that recommendation, if I'm not mistaken, is, um, I'm trying to think, my reference was from 2013 or 2014. The thing is that typically you, you talk about and you hear about bone density only on women. Only on women, only on women. And people tend to forget that men also can develop osteoporosis. They can develop fragility fractures and things like that. So that, re that recommendation has been there for a while. I just think that it, the women in that aspect, we, we kind of like, kind of like you guys in that, in that, in that topic. But no, it, it's, the recommendation is definitely there. The same, the same recommendation, for example, we always tell um, 65 and older women, you need to take your, cal well, actually, no, postmenopausal women, you need to take calcium and vitamin D supplementation to prevent bone um, density loss. The same should go for, for male. And the male uh, bone density loss, uh, I guess, uh, exam, is it invasive at all? No, it's, a, it's an x-ray. It's the same as it's the same as the female. It's the DEXA scan is an X-ray of your of your spine, and an X-ray of the of the femur. Okay, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Thank you. What is your opinion about taking hormones after menopause? So the recommendation is that the hormones should only be be offered to the patient if the patient has symptoms from menopause. And when we say symptoms, it's basically hot flashes and uh, vaginal dryness, vaginal discomfort, okay? Now, taking hormone replacement therapy has been shown that it helps with the bone loss um, density, the bone density loss, I'm sorry, and it can, it can give you certain protection um, cardiovascular, but there's not an indication to give it for those reasons. So I only recommend, um, and I talk to the patient about hormone replacement therapy, if they come in and say, doctor, I am dying, the hot flashes, I'm always red, I'm always sweaty, I can't sleep at night, things like that. So I talk to them, the first line of treatment is hormone replacement therapy. Um, I talk to them, I give them the risk and the benefits. It does have its risks. Um, you're at higher risk of developing breast cancer, higher risk of developing um, endometrial cancer if you still have your uterus, and higher risk of developing blood clots. It does protect you against colon cancer, so you have to put them in a balance. I give them all the information, and then um, basically the patient makes a decision. So do I recommend it for the right patient? Yes, but I always inform the patient of their risks and the benefits. So, and, and that's where you, that's, it, a hormone replacement therapy is one thing that you literally have to put on a balance. Some patients say, no, I don't want to. I'm scared of basically the, the effects, and I completely understand, because there, there are risks, and those risks have been documented by multiple studies and things like that. So thank God nowadays there are different options that you can offer the patient, some natural, some not natural supplements, but other type of options. They don't work as well, but some patients do very well with the other options. So we just talk about all the options. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat>
I understand that if you take calcium, that you're at a high risk of developing heart problems. Is that correct? It depends on the dosage of the calcium. So you have to abide by the recommended dose um, for uh, basically de depending on your age group. If you have an excess of calcium, so basically if you double the dose or, um, or take excess calcium, it, absolutely, yes, it does put you at risk of having heart issues. And that, that has been shown, it was a recent study if I'm not mistaken. Also, if you have osteoporosis, um, I understand that you should not take medication for it if you've had cancer. Am I correct? It depends on the type of medication. You are right. There is one medication for osteoporosis that works on estrogen and progesterone receptors that if you've had breast cancer, you should not use it because it can reactivate the cancer. You're absolutely correct. But there are different types of, um, of medication to treat osteoporosis. That type of medication um, that you're, you're, you're mentioning um, is basically on the, on the list of medications that are recommended is probably the third or the fourth. So it's not the first line treatment for osteoporosis nowadays. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. If you eat a lot of cheese, mm -hmm. is that considered as, you know, a problem rather than take medication? If you eat certain things that have a lot of calcium in them. You can supplement the calcium in your diet, absolutely. Milk cheese, but you have to be careful with the cheese, you have to be careful with the milk, because if you're overdoing it, then you're gonna have issues with your cholesterol. So you, yes, you can supplement with the, the, the nutrients with your diet, but you also have to be careful with the excess, because the excess can then lead to other issues. Perfect, thank you very much. Thank you. And then, one-on-one -on -one questions, and then the bagels and coffee are in the have a lovely day. Thank you for coming.